again. Got a little different look this week. You know, we're going through a transition period right now and trying different things. And uh, This is still broadcast from my home, from another room in the home. And uh, so, like I say, we're going through a transition. Things may look different next week. <laughs> so we'll see. In seeking the Lord this week, uh, I think I've got a really specific message that's going to bless you, bless me. Before I get into it, though, let me make an announcement, uh, because I know not everybody makes a regular habit of checking the homepage over at Dave Roberson Ministries at their website, but the decision was made this week, uh, there will not be a conference in October this year. Uh, the logistics of it is just too difficult to work out. Uh, we... We want to have a conference probably worse than you do because we miss all of you. We want to see your faces, hug your faces, go go somewhere and have lunch and pound the table like Dave would say and slurp coffee and talk about God, you know. <laughs> Fellowship is really important and that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together and we want to and you want to. But this year, the logistics and, and many other things are just really difficult, so... With sadness, the decision was made this week. In case you haven't heard, uh, there's not going to be a, an October conference this year here in Tulsa. That does not change our assignment, and that's really what today's message about, is that we are still on assignment. Now, I know you know this story very well, but I'm going to read it to you again. And this comes after Jesus had taught, really all day, to, first to the people, then he explained in more detail to his disciples about the sower sows the word in Mark 4. But what's amazing, at the end of Mark 4, we, we see an absolute demonstration of everything that he taught. So I brought my Bible back here, and uh, if you want to open up to Mark chapter 4, I know you've heard a, probably a thousand messages on Mark 4, but here we go again, because we need, we need this, because it's got everything to do with where do we go from here. A great storm has arisen, don't you know? We don't have a building to meet in. We're not having a conference. Oh my goodness, are we going to die? <laughs> anyway, you can already see, you know what's in this passage I'm about to read. But let me, uh, let me, let me just read it again so it's fresh in our minds. I'm going to refer back to a few things from time to time here today. So Mark chapter 4, we'll pick it up in verse 35. And it's so important to me that it says, and the same day, <laughs> the same day that he has been teaching them about the sower sows the word and how important it is. Because if you don't understand this parable, how are you going to understand all parables? In other words, this one is crucial. You've got to understand this. You got to understand this. Otherwise, just to be honest with you, you're, you're going to not accomplish much fruit for the kingdom. That's re See, the end result, you know, we always, the sower sows the word. The way in we, for decades, my mind was, well, it's all about the word. In a way, it is. But in a way, it's not. <laughs> what it's about is fruit. Because the, the way that parable ends is so, some of the seed fell on good ground, and there were those that produced fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. It, the fruit is the whole point. When the sower sows the word, the end result is fruit. Why hasn't God, why hasn't Jesus already returned? We're told he's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. There's still people to be saved. There's still people that, that he's res he wants to rescue from the lost species of Adam and get them over, born again, into the family of God before the end comes. The end result of this is fruit in every way, not just people is being saved, but broken bodies being healed and marriages put back together, just all kind of fruit, fruit, okay? And also the other kind of fruit, because he's coming back for a bride that's without spot or wrinkle. Well, he's not talking about these kind of wrinkles. He's talking about holiness. It really is. He's talking about a bride that's holy. Well, church has got a ways to go. I don't know if you've noticed that. Okay, I'm preaching instead of reading. Let me... <laughs> I hope you guys are not depressed and down and, and uh, you know, oh, woe is us. No, blessed is us. Blessed is us. And we have not been relieved of our assignment. Okay, 
Let me read so I can teach and then preach, okay? Verse 35, And the same day when the evening was come, he saith unto them, now here he is, he's, got, he's about to sow the word. He's given them a command. This is their assignment. Let us pass over unto the other side. As always, it's clear. You know what to do. Uh, they know how to do this. He's talking about going to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, these are Some of them are fishermen their whole life. They certainly know how to do it. They know what to do now. And so, okay, they're, and they're eager to do it. The word fell on good ground, <laughs> you know, as far as being, yes, we're ready, okay, and let, let's do this. But see, now he didn't tell them why. And this is what I found in my own walk with the Lord all these years. Sometimes he does, but most times he does not tell you why. He tells you enough for you to take the action. He never tells you to do something really that's impossible. Uh, it may look impossible, but it's not. <laughs> But he, often he doesn't tell you why. He didn't tell them why. Now, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because I missed it for years. I thought, I thought this whole thing ended at the end of Mark chapter 4, and it doesn't. It doesn't end until Mark chapter 5, about verse 20 or so. Because the whole point of crossing over to the other side, what did they find when they got there? The madman of Gadara. And, the, and it wasn't even just about him. Not only, I mean, it is. Because Jesus, he, he had left the safety of the 99, if you'll allow me, and gone seeking after this one who was lost. Boy, was he lost. I mean, this guy was famous in that whole region. They couldn't, you know, they couldn't bind this guy with chains, much less ropes. I looked it up. It says chains and, and, and fetters. I mean, fetters, I had to look that up. <laughs> That's ankle chains, you know, and they could not hold this guy. He was so possessed. And it's to me, it's such a type of all of us in a way because he is beyond all human help. It, even Jesus didn't try and counsel this guy. <laughs> he didn't say, it says he immediately began speaking to those devils. You come out of him. You come out of him. Because this guy was beyond all human help. Now, he was beyond any 12-step program, and I'm not against those. But he was beyond your counseling sessions. He was beyond that. And, you know, he, he needed a life-changing encounter with the living Christ, and didn't we all? See, all of us were lost and beyond human help. There was, an, he, he, there was nothing we could do to get back to God. We were born into the wrong species. We were born into a, a, a dead species of Adam, and there was no way to escape. You, you can't change your species by good works. You can't change your species by uh, anything. Only God could devise a plan where he could send his son to take our death for us, where we could be baptized into his death and then be reborn as children of the living God. <laughs> and he, as Alan says, he didn't lose you in the process. You're still you. You were you before. You're you now. You did belong to the family of Adam, but now you're a child of the living God. Only God could devise such a supernatural plan. No wonder the Bible says the gospel is the power of God. You talk about power. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Am I, I think I'm preaching again. <laughs> but the gospel is so amazing. It's so wonderful. And the more I learn of it, the more amazed I am about the whole thing. But we were all sort of like the madman of Gadara. Each and every one of us had to have a supernatural encounter with the living Christ. He, 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 he had to rebirth us. We, had, we went through such a change, we don't even realize what happened to us. We, were, we died as one species and was resurrected to new life in another. My goodness, we are the children of the living God. And here the devil wants you to think you're the same old sinner just saved by grace. No bigger lie was ever told. I'm telling you right now, that's a lie. Anyway. Have I made it out of one verse? I, <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to read verse 35 again. <laughs> and the same day when the evening was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over to the other side. They got their assignment. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. Let me have to stop for a moment. 
Jesus told them exactly this is what the kind of thing that will happen. Because he, it's the same day that he taught the parable of the sower sows the word. And he says, Satan comes immediately to steal the word that was sown. In this case, what was the word that was sown? Let us pass over to the other side. Here comes a big storm. Can't do it. Nope. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. And, th and th this storm was so fierce that these experienced fishermen who has weathered storms their whole life on that same sea, even they are thinking we're going to die. <laughs> you know? What's the purpose? The purpose is exactly what Jesus said in that parable. It's to steal the word so that there's never any fruit. You'll see it here real clear in a minute. So verse, th uh, so verse 38, And he, Jesus, was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Now stop for a moment. Notice they did not say, Master, we're really having a hard time getting to the other side. <laughs> Is that what's on their mind now, getting to the other side? No. It's, it's survival now. We're going to die. We're going to die. And see, it always seems like that. It's fear. See, I remember when, the, when I got my first assignment, really, from the Lord back when, in the days when I was still driving trucks, and I'd been praying for about two years, minimum 40 hours a week, because I was in a job where I could, they, just driving those trucks. I was basically, God had me in the perfect job for a middle-aged man that doesn't have time to waste. I was catching up, you know, and he had me in the perfect job where I could get paid to pray. And, but I was doing it, see. And so after roughly two years of, of uh, praying and praying, 40, 50, 60 hours a week sometimes in those trucks, boy, I got, I got my marching orders. And he told me what to do. He told me to go full time. And, uh, he, I mean, it was so clear. He said, I think I can still quote it. I could take you to the mile marker in Arkansas where I heard it. It's clear to me, if you'd have been in the cab of the truck, you would have heard it. But he said, this is your last trip as a truck driver. When you get back off of this trip, give your, uh, give your boss, basically, two weeks' notice. He won't require it of you, and you'll be free to serve me full time. That was it. Is that clear? Yes. Do I know what to do? Yes. Uh, is there any part of it that was unclear? No. <laughs> Gary, well, you certainly did that, didn't you? No, I didn't do that. <laughs> Why? A great storm arose, <laughs> a storm of fear. What do you mean go full time? Nobody's asking me to preach anywhere. Uh, we have no income at all other than this driving this truck. Lord, I remember now. I mean, I didn't say all of these things, but I, I really did by my actions because <laughs> I didn't do it. But all this, all this was coming up and like, you know, Lord, I, I have a car payment. Are you aware that I have a car payment? I probably should have asked, is there a company car? <laughs> Do I get a ministry car? I have insurance. I got to pay insurance. I have a wife with an eating problem, God. She wants to eat every day, sometimes more than once. <laughs> I'm, I'm being a little bit silly, but not really. A great storm arose. And see, my thinking, just like the disciples, was not about, oh, Lord, it's all about you and your call and what you want to do and the fruit that you want to accomplish. And yeah, you know, I wasn't thinking about that at all. What was that? What what was what was the purpose of the great storm? Get me survival. <laughs> Get me thinking about me and my life and our bills and our how will we survive? How will I pay my bills? On and on and on, and it worked. And the word. At, for a while at least, became unfruitful because I didn't do what he said. See, and that's why the great storms always come. And they're usually accompanied by fear, just like here. Mm, okay, okay. <laughs> I got a little bit of instruction there myself. Let's go on just a little bit. All right. So I want to read verse 38 again because the question is so revealing. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. Boy, one thing's for sure. I mean, he's in the same ship they're in. They have this treasure in a wooden vessel right there. You know, I mean, he's, he's wearing flesh and blood. He could be drowned. Don't think he couldn't. The boat could be sunk. It's a wooden vessel. Is he worried? He's asleep. <laughs> he's not worried at all. 
they awake him and they say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we're having trouble getting to the other side? It's so revealing. That is not on their mind at all. The purpose, the storm accomplished its purpose. It stopped them from accomplishing their mission. And in their mind, they're not even thinking about the mission. They're thinking about survival. And that's what fear nearly always does. Carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said in, unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Now before we go on, I've, I've heard this preach both ways, that uh, maybe they should have calmed the storm, maybe they should have spoken his name. And to be honest with you, I still have that question on the shelf I have for many years. I know Paul didn't do it when uh, he was uh, sunk uh, you know, ships were sunk out of him. Uh, I don't see any. Anyway, I could go on and on about my meditations. I think, but I do have scripture for this. I do know that we're told, cast the whole of your care upon him, for he careth for you. See, look how he words that. Carest thou not that we perish? They're doubting that he even cares about them. Don't you care? We're about to die here, Lord. And we're about to die trying to serve you. Don't you care that we are about to perish? Well, that's the opposite of what it says over there about it. Cast all, cast the whole of your care upon him. See, in Jesus, earlier in the same day, he told them that one of the tactics that the enemy uses are the cares of this world. And recently I heard Bronk teach about casting the whole of your care upon him. And I, I wondered, is that the same word care as Mark chapter 4? And I looked it up and it is. So they did the right thing here. They did it kind of with the wrong uh, attitude. Because they're going, I, I, don't you even care? Now it's interesting what he says in the next verse. Don't you care? But for today's lesson, really notice What's on their mind? It's not getting to the other side. The storm has accomplished the purpose. It's survival now. Same thing that kept me from obeying God. And I, I'd like to tell you that's the only time I ever let fear stop me. We're going on. <laughs> well, they did cast their care finally on him. They asked him for help. Don't you care? I wish they'd asked it a little different way. And look what he does. See, when you cast your care on him, because he cares for you, well, he did something about it, didn't he? He stopped the storm. Gee, I wonder if we would ever learn to cast the whole of our care upon him in prayer and do it with the right attitude. I know you care about me. I know that you tenderly watch over me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And if the, Boy, now there's the right kind of attitude. And David was in really dire straits too. Okay, verse 40. After he stops the storm, so they're out of danger now, he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now, he asked them two questions. Why are you so fearful? I'll, can I just tell you the truth? Because we're more naturally minded than we are spiritually minded, and we're more moved by what we see than we are by what he said. I'm, I'm thinking of Gary now even more than I am them. Let's talk about them for a minute. Well, when you're an experienced fisherman and you've, you've weathered storms on that sea your whole life, but this storm is the worst of them all, and your, your boat is full of water, it says. And no doubt they've been toiling and working, and I don't know whether it had sails, whether it had oars, or buckets or bailing the water out of the boat. I can just see them with all of their human wisdom and all of their human expertise and all of their human strength doing everything they know to do, trying to obey the Lord. Golly, that sounds like Gary so many times when I'm trying to do it and don't even realize that I'm trying to do what he told me to do in my own strength, my own wisdom. See, right now, 
the situation we have here at the prayer center. I mean, we all want to meet together. I hate, I hate, that's not the right word. Well, maybe. <laughs> I really dislike intensely not getting together and not seeing your faces. You can tell it's, it's, it's hard. Uh, not having the live worship with our worship teams. Being assembled together and let that sweet presence, I mean, I feel his presence here, but his presence there, meeting together. Well, yeah, it, it, it's, it's hard. I, I don't like the present circumstances, see. But that has not relieved us from our assignment any more than it relieved them of their assignment. I can't, we can't let fear control us, this great storm that has come. See, and almost shortly, just within a month of the building being closed, the Lord spoke through a prophecy and said, the enemy is coming with some tactics that you have not seen before. Well, we certainly hadn't seen that one before, had we? <laughs> I'm going to close your building down. And then one day you drive up and you go blink, blink as you're looking at the the signs that are on the door, the front door, the prayer center, and by order of the fire marshal, you know, uh, no nobody can be in there, and and it's, you're, you're, it's like four ugly signs, <laughs> really ugly signs on the door, red, and blink, blink, like Dave used to say, you're like a, a cow at a new gate. I've gone through this, <laughs> we've gone through the doors of this building hundreds and hundreds of times, you know, like a cow at a new gate. And suddenly they put a new gate on this path that you've walked a hundred times. And, and the cow goes, is looking at the gate. And what is this? Well, I think those of us that drove over there and saw it or got the information by email or something, blink, blink. What are you doing? <laughs> what? What? So in this word, it says the enemy, the prophecy, it said the enemy is coming with some tactics that you have not seen before. But the Lord says, but rest assured. I have seen them before, and I promise you, if you will turn to me and seek me for my counsel, I will tell you exactly what to do. See, we're not wanting to be like the men in the boat here who relied on their own strength and their own wisdom and their own past experience and their own knowledge and their own education trying to fix it. Not this time. We've all... I mean, I'm 75. I've had a belly full of that. Tim's a little older. He's had a belly full. We don't want, and nobody needs us to fix it. We want his fix it. We want his wisdom. I don't even care what it is now. I'm at the point I really don't. I just want what he wants. Whatever you say, Lord, that's what we're going to do. But in the meantime, we can't let fear control us. We can't let emotions control us. And uh, I just know what he said. He said, I'll tell you exactly what to do. Well, we're going to keep seeking him. This is, this is a great time to put into practice all of the messages that Pastor Dave taught us and everything we've learned down through the years about waiting on God. And that's exactly what we're doing, waiting on God, not spending our time in the flesh, not spending our time going bowling. I'm not picking on anything. I'm just saying not, not forsaking the things that we know we've been told to do. One of the things he recently reinforced again, he said, go back and listen to those blueprint prophecies and listen to them again and again. And the subsequent prophecies that have come since. Well, there's quite a few of those. And if you occupy yourself with listening to those and then doing what they say, we're going to stay on track. See, to me, those prophecies, those are our, for us, that is our let us pass over to the other side instructions. Gary, what do you mean, pass over to the other side? See, Dave received a mandate from the Lord, and you know it very well, all those years ago, to take a group of people, go far enough into God, to bring a supernatural revival to a religious city that will spread around the world. See, we're, we're, he's calling us to go to the other side of religion. What I mean by that is we're not content even with a mega church, if the prayer center had 10,000 people coming every week and we had the finest building and we had the great, I'm going to exaggerate, the best coffee in the lobby, we had the finest chandeliers, we had the most primo green line carpet. 
<laughs> at a fancy level building where you didn't get exercise walking through the building. <laughs> if we had everything, 10,000 members. But we can't get Homer Betancourt's eyesight back. We can't get Lynn Perez's son Tommy out of the wheelchair. We can't we we can't get the brain from our Venus's daughter. There's already mega churches in this very city, and I'm not against any of them. Thank God for each and every one of them. Every person that gets born again, every person that gets healed. Every person filled with the Spirit, thank God for your, these churches. But we've already got those in town. There's more than one. He's called us to cross over to the other side, to something beyond what's happening now. Listen, the whole world is full of madmen of Gadaris, if you don't mind me using that. They're beyond human help. He wants us to cross over to where... And one of the promises in those, in the blueprints is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John will be restored in the earth. Everything that you see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we are going to see in this great revival. That means the Homer Bettencourts will see, the Tommy Perez's will be freed from cerebral palsy. And if they need a new brain, bless God, they're going to get a new brain. Hallelujah. I was about to preach myself happy. We can't let this storm stop us. From our assignment. Because at first he says, why are you so fearful? Well, because the storm, the natural circumstances are so bad. And because we still think like natural humans more than we think like sons and daughters of God, we let the circumstances make us afraid. It's, Jesus wasn't afraid, and that's who we're conforming to. Here we go, Here we go. Romans 12, 2, that we be no longer like this world but that we be transformed, metamorphosis. How? By the renewing of the mind. His mind was not fearful. He was in the same circumstances they were, but his mind didn't have a speck, not a, not a bit of fear in it. He's asleep. Why? He's, he, well, he's there with a renewed mind, and there we're there with a natural mind. We become fearful. It's, it's again, it goes right back to why I didn't obey him when he told me to go full time at first. I, later on, I did, obviously, <laughs> but that's another story. But at first, I didn't. Why? The storm, the natural circumstances, the fear. And it really comes down to just not knowing him very well, although you think you do. I mean, at that time, I, I was a pretty good Bible student. So then he asked the second question, though. He says, How is it that you have no faith? Well, here we go again. I've heard so many different opinions on that. I've had I've had various opinions. See, because these guys worked hard all night. I mean, they struggled. They they used all of their muscles, all of their experiences. These fishermen, they bailed, they rowed, they did whatever with the sails. They somebody's on the rudder of the ship trying to get it going the right way, and still with all of their best efforts. Looks like the boat's going to sink and they're all going to die. So at times I thought, well, maybe he meant, uh, how is it you have no faith, meaning you don't think God's going to deliver you? Or another way is, well, you have no faith because you're only relying on your human strength instead of turning to God. That's another opinion. I've had that opinion down through the years. My current opinion, my current thinking on it, and I mean, this may change. How is it you have no faith? How is it you've given up on the assignment I gave you? What makes you think it's dismissed? Why Why are you only concerned about your own life now? Why are you concerned that I don't even care? See, here's another opinion. The ultimate in having no faith is don't you care? When really, cast the whole of your care upon him, for he careth for you. See, as soon as you start thinking he doesn't care for you, <laughs> I think he'd call that no faith. You, you don't trust that he loves you anymore? You don't think he will move to help you anymore? What? I, that's pretty close to no faith, I think. But anyway, for today's assignment, one aspect of how is it you have no faith, 
Have you forgotten the assignment I gave you? Have you let this storm? Didn't I tell you earlier today that Satan comes immediately to steal the word that was sown? Didn't I say, let us cross over, let us pass over to the other side? Didn't I tell you that? Have you forgotten it totally? Now you're totally diverted unto just my life and are we going to survive? And I'm not even sure you care. <laughs> you got to watch it during this season. I myself, myself, I've had, I've had to rein in these thoughts and bring them into captivity. Lord, don't you know that we don't have a building to meet in? Lord, are you aware we're not assembling ourselves? <laughs> uh, Lord, are you aware our worship teams have no people to lead in worship? <laughs> in the sense of a building, I'm talking. And sadly, I've had to cast down the thought, Lord, don't you care? Well, if we ever get like that, that's no faith. If you want to hurt his heart, start telling him he doesn't care about you. Because he does. And he's not ignorant of everything that's going on. And trust me, there is a plan. We just haven't seen it yet. We will. We'll look back on this and go, oh, okay. See, when they got to the other side, it was, oh, he, he, look at this, madman of Gadara. That's why we're here. <laughs> okay. But for today's lesson, one aspect of that, how is it you have no faith is, I'm going to say it a different way. I'll say it, I'll say it the way my dad probably, my OR carpenter probably would have said it to me as a teenager. Boy, you haven't, you haven't done yet what I told you to do. And you're not relieved from your assignment. You get back in there until you do. Yes, sir. <laughs> They're not relieved from their assignment. They still had to get to the other side. Listen, we are not relieved from our assignment to get to the other side of religion. Keep pressing into God. Please, please do what the Lord said and go back and get those uh, the first ten prophecies that we labeled the blueprint. Get them back on your phone. Get them back on your computer. Get them back on a CD in your car. Whatever means you have to hear those again and again and again. While you're praying in the Spirit, keep that vision alive. And then the subsequent prophecies, these are all part of the vision of an instruction of getting to the other side of religion where the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the maimed are made whole, and on occasion the dead are raised. And when the people come expecting to receive from Jesus, no matter what it is, they get it. First time. Every time. No exceptions. Jesus, you healed them all then. You healed them all now. Nothing has changed. Well, yeah, it has, Gary. A great storm has come. Well, what's that? They closed our building. <laughs> Does, does that relieve us from our assignment? The fact that their ship was about to sink, did that relieve them from their assignment or did they still need to get to the other side? Now, to me, the missing ingredient for them, and maybe us, is casting the whole of their care upon the Lord. As soon as they did, even though they did it sort of accusing, thank God His mercies are new every morning, but they did cast it on the Lord. They finally turned to Him for help. Well, we're already turning to Him for help, I'm telling you. One of the reasons no decisions has been made, let's rent this thing, let's let's buy that building, let's meet over there, is we don't want to fix it. But not with man's wisdom. Listen, Tim is Tim is really smart. Alan is really smart. Derek, all of the staff, they could they can come up with ten thousand ways to fix this temporarily and tells us, you know, that but that's just not what he said. He said, You turn to me. You turn to me for my wisdom, and I will not withhold it from you. And I'll tell you exactly what to do. Well, that's what we want. We don't want anything else. Now, for you and for me, in the meantime, what's our assignment? Well, what did the blueprint say? Come away with me, my beloved. Spend time with me in prayer. Lots of time. Spend time with me in worship. Spend time in my word. And yes, spend time in fasting. We have not been relieved from our assignment. We have cast the whole of our care upon him because he cares for us. And our job is not to worry. Our job is to rejoice. And again, I say rejoice and be
be filled with the Spirit at all times and giving him thanks right in the midst of the circumstances. I think of the Apostle Paul and Silas in prison. They hadn't done anything wrong. They'd only done exactly what the Lord told them to do, and here they are. They'd been beaten and whipped and in the stocks in prison. And boy, could they have, Lord, don't you care? Don't you care? <laughs> they could have done that. But they see, they did the right thing. And I love it that it says at midnight, which is just symbolic of the darkest hour, I think. At midnight, they began to sing and worship and praise God, not in a church, not in a synagogue, not even in a believer's home, in prison, in the stocks, backs bleeding, pain racking their body. What do you think we should do, Silas? I believe it's time to worship God. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. Boy, if there was ever a time that you talk about he's growing us up. He's growing us up. If there was ever a time that we need to act like grown-ups now. And continue to cast the whole of our care upon him because he cares for us. And know that he, he is at work behind the scenes where we cannot see. And our job is to praise and worship and glorify him right in the midst of our circumstances. No matter what it looks like, no matter how it seems, no matter what our emotions say, no matter what our logic says. I worship you, I glorify you, I praise you. You care for us. We cast the whole of this upon you, Lord, because we know you care for us. That roaring lion is not going to devour us because he can't find any care. See, Dave used to teach us all the time because that passage says, resist the devil and he'll flee. And it says he goes about as a roaring lion, as a roaring lion. He's really not one. But he goes around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And Dave says, if you're going to leave it in context, what makes a person devourable? It's the person that takes the care. If you keep the care cast over on the Lord, you can't be devoured by the enemy. And for today's lesson, I would say that keeps you going, that keeps you in your assignment of crossing over to the other side. Gary, what does that mean? You stay in prayer. But when we had a building, we had a group, now it was small, a remnant because not everybody can come, but there's people all around the world that would join. But we had we had times of prayer established at the building. Most of you remember from Wednesday, it was 10 in the morning till 8.30 at night. Friday, 10 in the morning till 8.30 at night. Saturday, 7 a.m. to noon. Well, that's that was kind of the minimum, you know. And not everybody can do that. I know some people have jobs and got kids at home and whatever, but many of us could, and the ones that could, were pretty faithful to do it and you might have to you know there was times I'd have to leave and go pick up my granddaughter from school or stuff so I'd come right back and finish it and I was I'm always impressed by people that put in a hard day working a regular you know eight hour day job but after they get off maybe maybe at five o'clock and by the time they get to the church at six o'clock but they still come and pray until 8 30 bless God what they have to give they're given they are part of the assignment, and their reward won't be any less than those of us that could stay longer. But now the point for today is, well, if you add that time up, it's been a while since I did it, it's roughly 20-some-odd hours, if I remember right. Is that right? Anyway, whatever it was. <laughs> Don't have a calculator handy here. Whatever it was, well, what's your prayer life like now? Do you still have one? <laughs> What's your worship like? What is your worship life like now? Still worshiping him and glorifying him right in the midst of the troubles? What about your time in the word? Spending time in the word? Are you waiting until we meet again? So open your Bibles to so and so. Or are you spending time in the word yourself? And hopefully there's some fasting going on. See, we've not been relieved of our assignment. We're still called, let us pass over to the other side. And the reason is the fruit. Listen, in those prophecies, he has said, we are coming into the greatest revival that mankind has ever seen. The things that we're going to see in this revival are things nobody living on planet Earth has ever seen. Oh, my.
I'm sorry, I, I got caught up with Pastor Dave's vision for a moment. There's a, for those of you that's never been to a, the prayer center, there's a large parcel of land available for sale, probably 80 acres, I would think, maybe more, right across from us. If you go right, right out the front door, walk across the parking lot, there's a barbed wire fence, and on the other side of us, right there is this big, giant, beautiful, vacant field. And Dave, more than once, would see that field just full of ambulances, and people bringing their sick, and bringing them on cots and stretchers and wheelchairs and because they couldn't all fit in the building. And why? Because they're, they're bringing them to be healed because they heard that Jesus is risen. And Jesus is alive in a, a group of people. And if you can just get your sick child or your, your blind mother or whoever it is, if you can just get them there, Without doubt, they're going to be healed. First time, every time, no exceptions. And I just saw that again in my spirit. And whether it's that literal field or not, I don't know. But I do know this, that when that gets to happening on a regular basis, not just by the gifts, and I thank God for the gifts, but when God is able to pour this out on a group of people that are so mature, he can that, that anointing can rest permanently upon them. And it's not just a fivefold. God says, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. And Dave would say, that means Joe, public, Mary, wallpaper, you. You. That the enemy keeps trying to crush with all of these storms in the natural. But the truth of it is, you're a warrior for God that's been called to go to the other side. And you're fighting, you don't know it, but in the spirit, if you could see it, you're fighting tens of thousands of devils that's trying to stop you at all costs. What is your prayer life like? We have not been relieved of our assignment. What is your worship life like now that we can't meet and assemble? What is your fasting time? I was torn today between this message and just focusing on confessing the word because death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those that love it you're going to live by it. You're going to reap what you sow with your tongue. James said the tongue is like the, the rudder. I don't care how big the ship is. You know, you see these giant cargo ships loaded with those, you know, those big metal containers, container ships. Dear God, how much tonnage, how, how massive are those things? Yet in a big storm out in the ocean, they can be, they can be blown many directions. But, and James says, I don't care how big the ship is. I don't care how fierce the winds are. That ship, its course is changed by one thing and one thing only. He said on the ship, it's the rudder. But he was comparing it to our tongue. I don't care how fierce the winds are blowing. I don't care the size of your ship. I don't care the size of your ministry, big or small. I don't care. The tongue is how you change the course of it. What are you saying? Are, are you speaking in line with what God has said in the prophecy? Or are you speaking in line with the circumstances? And I'm sure, do we have enemies out there? When I say we, I mean, okay, baby, I'm it. I started to say the prayer center, but it's really not the prayer center. Well, they're against the plan of God, and they're being unwittingly used, I think. But we have a lot of people speaking against us that have been speaking against us for a long time and saying things that I don't even want to give life to at all. I'm just not going to yield my tongue to it. But they just, they badmouth the prayer center, badmouth the ministers, badmouth the message. And I, hard to believe they even badmouth Dave. <laughs> I know that's hard to believe. But anyway, I've heard it. I've heard it. I don't know what I mean, Kane. Well... They're, they've got their rudder set in agreement with hell. There's just no better way to put it. How do you have your rudder set? How do you, are, are, which way are you steering your ship? Because I guarantee you, you're doing it with your tongue. A good friend of mine one time said, the enemy's always got, there's like a thousand doubts in my mind, you know, and they're all running around looking for one thing. What are they looking for? Those doubts are running around looking for my tongue because they'll die unborn if they're never spoken. Good 
God, that's good preaching right there. That's just good preaching. So I, maybe I'll just, I guess I'll just incorporate this last part here with confession. Now, why'd you lay your Bible down? I heard lay your Bible down. <laughs> Instead of me read the rest of the story, he wants me to talk about it. See, because they did get to the other side. And in that story, in Mark 4 and 5, Really, at that time, for the disciples, once they got to the other side, their work was finished. They never, none of the disciples said a word to the madman of Gadara. Not a, one, not a one of them cast a devil out. Not one, not a one of them laid hands on him. In that story, their job, and again, I want to refer you back to the foundation verses. You know, we have this treasure in earthen vessel. Well, they had the treasure, Jesus, in a wooden vessel. And their job was to bring his presence, his physical presence in that case, where he told them to bring it. But once they've got him there and he steps onto the shore, really there, they are finished. They don't have anything else. They're watching, but they didn't help at all. They didn't say anything or do anything. And they watch while Jesus speaks. Primarily, he speaks on this one, using the sword of the Spirit, commanding those devils to come out of the man. And, and, of course, they argued with him and asked not to be, you know, totally dismissed. They asked to be sent into the pigs. And he allowed that and sent them into the pigs. And there was about 2,000. How possessed was this guy? Holy cannoli. I hope that's okay to say on a <laughs> church tape, church recording. <laughs> Holy cannoli. <laughs> wow. 2,000? You know, it talks about Mary of Magdalene, and he cast seven devils out of her, and she gave her whole life to him. Well, he cast maybe two, maybe two thousand devils out of this guy, and he wanted to give his life to Jesus, and he wanted to go with Jesus. Now, this guy was famous in that whole region. He had been there for years, and nobody even passed by that way. It says because it was dangerous. He'd run naked and cutting himself with stone, sharp stones, or something and moaning and they they would try to to bind him up with chains and they couldn't bind him i mean every this guy was famous in that region and when jesus is through with him he's sitting there clothed and in his right mind and of course he wanted to go with jesus wouldn't you i would have too I, jesus you you saved me you delivered me i was beyond all human help and you came and you rescued me by the power of god a lot of want to go with him too, but see Jesus. He sowed the word a second time in a way because he sowed this man back into that region. That It tells us that is the region of Decapolis, and that means ten cities. There was ten cities in that region. All of them knew about the madman of Gadara. This guy was famous. When I was in South Africa, they I learned about a man. I knew his name for years, and now I've forgotten it. I'm sorry about that, but he was... He was like the he was the guy that the gangsters were afraid of. <laughs> I mean, he was the baddest of them all. And like it remind, every time I think about the madman of Gadara, I mean they tried everything. This guy was so bad that crooks were afraid of this guy. Well he wound up in prison, but in prison he got radically saved, radically filled with the Holy Ghost. And God's he should have spent the rest of his natural life in prison, but God got him out. Why? Because he had a plan for him. And this guy, he became such an evangelist. He'd travel all over South Africa. And people would go, is that, is that, I wish I could remember his name. Is that so-and-so? That's the same guy? He's the one that would rob the other gangsters? He's the one that would kill the other gangsters? He's the one, he was the worst of them all. Yet he's saying Jesus saved him and delivered him. I always thought Jesus was not real, but if if that's true, if this man can be saved, then Jesus has to be alive. And this guy wins more crooks to Jesus than any church over there because they can't deny it. They know what he was, and they know what he is now. And you can't deny it. The truth of it is just in him. And he's having, he had, when I was there, he was having a tremendous effect 
because not only were the crooks getting saved, but he'd have these meetings and the word would get out. This, this guy who was the worst of them all that terrorized South Africa for decade, for more than a decade has gotten saved and delivered and he's a totally different man and God's using him and people would come. Well, that's exactly Jesus' plan for Decapolis because everybody knew this guy. He was the worst of the worst. He's crazy. He runs naked. He cuts himself. He, he can't even hold this guy with chains. He's got supernatural power to break the chains off of him and everybody knew him. Yet Jesus says, because he wants to go with Jesus. I don't blame him. But Jesus says, no. I want you to go back into this region. I just want you to tell what great things the Lord has done for you. See, Jesus never really calls him an evangelist. He just wants him to share his testimony. See, in Revelations, I'm hearing that verse, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And we love not our lives unto the, unto the dead. Well, this man, he had no life, really, before Jesus came. Jesus is sending him with the word of his testimony. That's what the, crook in, the saved crook in South Africa does. He just tells what things Jesus has done for him. And the fruit, hundreds and probably thousands, maybe tens of thousands have been saved because he goes about telling what great things the Lord has done for him in South Africa. And this man went about telling what great, in all of the ten cities, that whole region, telling what great things the Lord had done for him. Jesus has sown the word again. This time he's sowing it in a man to go and tell. Don't have to be a great theologian. Just tell your own testimony. My job's not to ignore the pictures, and I, I just saw me sitting in a doctor's office recently. Most of you know I recently had uh, some heart problems, and they fixed me up with some open heart surgery. And uh, I'm still going through uh, uh, the rehabilitation process. I've got about another month of that, getting stronger, and they monitor your heart. And it looks like everything's going great, feeling better all the time. And uh, you remember, my mother's 101, working on 102. I'm going to be here a while, okay? But what I saw right there, talk about sharing the word of your testimony. Because in the process of this, I have seen, I've been in tests by heart doctors, and nurses, technicians, before and after. And see, the heart condition that I had before, that really is what caused me to quit driving the trucks, it has a name, it's called supraventricular tachycardia. And I don't want to go into detail, but the end result of it is, as long as you have that, then there's a chance you can black out at just about any time. Well, it's, how many knows it's not good to black out when you're driving an 80,000-pound truck down the road? <laughs> so I couldn't be trusted anymore to drive trucks because of that condition. That's why I had to quit. But see, the thing about that condition is, medically, they say that once you have it, it's incurable. And you'll have it the rest of your life. Well, I was diagnosed with it in early 1995. But yet, when they look on my chart now, they see no evidence of it. When they do all of these, man, I've, been, I've had echograms. I've had, put you on a treadmill and do an EKG. Uh, I've had the, where they put the iodine or whatever that is in you and look at all your vessels. I mean, I've had test after test. Everything, they've looked at me six ways from Sunday when it comes to the heart, but one thing they don't ever see is supraventricular tachycardia. And so, but it's on, my, it's on my record. If you go back far enough, they say, how do you explain that? Or what's going on? Here's my madman of Gadara opportunity. <laughs> I go, so, well, my pastor, Dave Roberson, he prayed for me in 1995. And the Lord weaned me off my medicine over a two-year period. Uh, most even, many of you have heard that testimony. In my case, it wasn't an instantaneous healing, although I think that's really the, the way he normally does it. But in my case, the Lord, I got prayed for. The power of God hit me so strong, I slid up under the front row <laughs> at the prayer center. But the symptoms didn't just immediately go away. And 
over a two-year period, I had to confess my healing and listen and obey the Lord as he slowly weaned me off of the medicine that they had me on. But at the end of that two-year period, I still remember it was May of 1998, I was going to, I, I took the last pill out of that bottle and I was going to go get it refilled. And the Lord said, don't refill it. You're healed. You'll never need it again. Well, I don't go through that whole process, but I tell them like this. They say, well, when the doctors or the technicians or the nurses, which has been more than one during this time period, well, it says here that you have supraventricular tachycardia, but you're not taking any medication and we don't see any symptoms of it. Well, what's going on with that? Or however they'd ask me. So I would tell them like this. I just... I said, well, listen, my pastor, Dave Roberson, prayed for me in 1995. I felt the power of God hit me. And the Lord weaned me off of that medicine over a two-year period. But my healing, I was healed in May of 1998. And I've never taken a dose of that medicine again. And I've never had the symptoms again, really. And I'm healed. Well, there's my opportunity. And I don't, I don't shrink back. I tell them plainly, my pastor prayed for me. Jesus healed me. That's why I don't have supraventricular tachycardia anymore. What am I doing? I'm telling what great things the Lord has done for me. If they if they ask or if they <laughs> if they just want, if they want me to keep talking, I'll tell them about the uh, what do you call it skin cancer that I had melanoma. Sorry, name left me for a minute. I said I was diagnosed another time and given six months to live with melanoma cancer. And uh, that's what the doctor said. We, you know, young man, we recommend you get your affairs in order. We don't think you have six months. And you can see the scar for that one on my chest. It goes this way. Heart thing goes this way. <laughs> Got a road map now on my chest here. And I'll, I'll tell him. I say, well, that's what the that's what the doctor said. But my wife and I, we confessed the word. We held on to his report, and the end result. That's been a long six months because I was in my early 40s and now I'm 75. I'm pretty sure I'm healed, don't you, you know? <laughs> I tease with him a little bit. Well, Gary, what are you doing? I'm going about telling what great things the Lord has done for me. And you can do that. Everybody can do that. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be an evangelist. You just have to be willing to share your testimony. We overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We love not our lives unto death. We don't care what they think. Well, I do care what they think in the sense of I don't care what they think about me. I want them to think about Jesus being alive so that if they can be saved. And if they're already saved, maybe their faith can be strengthened through my testimony. Okay, I've only got a couple of minutes. Let me summarize. Listen, today's message is this. A great storm has arisen for sure. It's obvious to anybody that this great storm is intended to stop us and get us so fearful and get us thinking Jesus doesn't even care about us or nothing. Well, we don't want to wind up of him asking us, how is it you have no faith? Listen, he does care about us. He is fully aware of what's going on. He's already told us he has a plan for this. And our job is not to run off and fix it with our wisdom. Our job is to stay in there and hear his wisdom and do exactly what he says. And that's what we're going to do. And in the meantime, we have not been relieved from our assignment. What do you mean by that? Check your prayer life. What is... How many hours were you praying before? How many hours are you praying now? How, how much time were you spending in worship before? How much time are you spending now? Are you still pushing away from the table every now and then? Say, I just think I'll fast today. I think I'll just fast today. Or half a day. Something. Do something. Spend time in the Word. Well, you get weak if you don't spend time in the Word. And there's other storms, to be honest with you, in my life right now regarding my mother and other things. All of it is designed to steal all my time, steal all my attention. It wants to get me in the, to the same point that the disciples were in the boat. Lord, don't you care? Let me just say it directly as the way the Word says it. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time, casting the whole of your care upon Him, for He careth for you. We're not going to quit. We have not been relieved from our assignment. I'll see you on the other side. Bye-bye for now.